welcome back to Theory of Flight. I'm Ray Preston, and we're continuing to discuss how the aerodynamic force is formed. Now, remember last time we talked about how a venturi works, or how a, a funnel works, and we get a low pressure in the throat of the funnel. Now this time, I want to return to the ball that we looked at the time before, and I want to draw to your attention that if I put the funnel right there, these two fit together beautifully. Now, this is even more obvious if we had two balls. Since I don't have three hands, I decided to draw it in an animation. So, in this animation, there are two balls, and you can imagine the air flowing up between them and expanding into that funnel-shaped region above. And so, it's very easy to see in this case that there's going to be a low pressure along the sides of the ball. Now let's switch back to an animation that we looked at the time before last. So here we have uh, one ball, and the blue rectangle represents the air. Remember, we looked at this before. The, uh, the ball drops out of its vacuum, and last time we just drew it like this. We drew a vacuum above the ball, because that seemed obvious. The vacuum was there, that perfect vacuum. The ball falls out of it. The, resi the residual part of that vacuum is directly above the ball. But now that we understand this Venturi effect, the Bernoulli principle, we realize that the curved shape of the sides of the ball is going to cause the air to rush around the sides of the ball. And there's also going to be low pressure around the center of that ball. Now, the diagram is two-dimensional, but in the real ball, this is just going to be like a donut of low pressure right around the waist of the ball. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's pretty obvious now that we think about it, but it's really irrelevant because it's perfectly symmetric, so it's not going to have any influence at all on the aerodynamic force, and that's true. If this was the end of the story, there was hardly even any point to telling this chapter. But it is important because it gives us an opportunity. We can now ask ourselves, is there some way to distort that donut of pressure around the middle of the ball? Some way to make it asymmetric? And the answer is yes, we can do that. In order to know how we do that, we have to introduce one final theory. And it's one that, again, it's a very simple theory. Nobody has any problem with it. It's called the theory of friction. Friction says that any two objects, any two objects that rub past each other have friction. Now, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about my feet on the ground or skates on a frozen pond. There's obviously much less friction between my skates on a frozen pond than there is between my feet and the floor in this room. But there's still friction. When the air goes past the edge of that ball, there's going to be friction. Now again, it's still symmetric, so it's essentially irrelevant. It just means that our prediction of the air flowing around the, uh, the edge of the ball, <coughs> it's obviously going to flow a little slower than we would have expected if there was no such thing as friction. But now ask yourself this, what if we spin the ball? So if we start that ball spinning, now the friction is not the same on both sides. Now the friction over there on the left side is actually slowing the air down. That air that's rushing around the side of the ball, it's being slowed down. Remember, the movement of that air is taking air molecules out of that region and reducing the density of the air, so it's not going to be reduced as much. That low pressure will not be as intense. On the other side, the friction is actually helping the air move. It's giving it a kick in the pants, accelerating it around the side of the ball. So the, uh, the density of the air there will reduce even more, and the pressure will be even lower. So now we have a situation that looks like this. It's asymmetric. So I definitely don't have my aerodynamic force drawn correctly anymore. The aerodynamic force is now going to move out of the x-axis over like so. And this ball is no longer going to fall exactly straight down. 
in order to get the aerodynamic force back in the correct orientation, we have to rotate that graph like so. And now this ball begins to curve towards me. This, of course, is exactly how a major league pitcher throws a curveball. And for the first time, we're here. We've got lift, lift off. The aerodynamic force it was relatively easy to understand when it was in the x-axis. But now, for the first time, we've got it out of the x-axis. We're on our way. We've only got one more episode to go after this one. So in the next episode, we're going to figure out how the same phenomenon can be applied to a wing to get a really excellent lift to drag ratio because let's face it, the spinning ball, it does generate lift, but the lift to drag ratio compared to an airplane is pretty pathetic. It's less than one to one. It's enough though, if you could do it, you could earn a million dollars as a major league pitcher. So at least now you know how it's done. Hope to see you next time for the final episode of uh, season one. Until then, I'm Ray Preston, and this is Theory of Flight. <laughs>